Dr. Singh, would you like to kick this webinar off? Absolutely. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. This is Rena Singh from BIO. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the webinar on integrating TASCA into commercialization plans for renewable chemicals, which will be presented by Lynn Bergeson and Bergeson Campbell. And uh, uh, Lynn will make the introduction uh, with all the other uh, associates uh, that will be uh, also uh, presenting. So before I turn it over to Lynn, uh, could we please take a roll call? Uh, who do we have on the call? Um, we realize some of you have multiple att attendees in your room, in your conference rooms. If you could also please give a shout out as to who all you have. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started from bio. We've got Mina Singh. Laura Venius. Peter McHugh. This is Jeff Gilman with Elevance. I have in our conference room Alice Boomhauer, Michelle Mori Beeble, and Colin. Colin. Huey. Huey. This is Rob Mannon from Miriam Corporation in Boston. Greg Iconan from Mendelbach. This is David Glass from Jewel. Paul Nowatsky from Hi, Bayer Material Science. Mm -hmm. This is Iona Branscombe from Poet. There's several people around the table here, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Emily Gary. Thank you. Laura Martin. Dan Maffeo. Ben Lambert. Ray Christofferson. Fran Swain. Eric Peters from Alilix. This is Miguel Suazo with BioCollinate. This is Alex Lindquist from OPX Biotechnologies. Bill Pye from Lignol. This is Milo Noxon from Life Technologies. Jennifer Marshall from Tate and Lyle. Scott Prigno from Poet. Mary Sue Howard from Kinematica. Mrs. Freeman Miranda from Miriam. Okay. Amy Hitchcock from Byron. Rick Green from Sullivan. That about it? Any, anyone else? Didn't get a chance to identify themselves? Uh, Gary Lowe from Amaris. Okay. Anyone else would like to identify themselves? Okay. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining in. Appreciate it. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Lynn, and we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you very much, Dr. Singh, and thank you, BIO, for allowing us to do this uh, presentation. We are very excited about it, and we're just delighted to be here. Uh, this is Lynn Bergeson of Bergeson & Campbell, uh, D.C., a, a law firm located here in D.C., and for those of you who may not be as aware of uh, the firm, we are a law firm that focuses on chemicals of all sorts, conventional, nanoscale, bio-based, and any combination thereof. Uh, we are located here in the D.C. area, but we also have uh, affiliates located in uh, the U.K. and in China. Uh, we have a team here of both lawyers and scientists, and complementing those two skill sets, regulatory and government affairs experts. Uh, we really do try to cover the globe and address the needs of the chemical community in confronting the growing number of challenges with dealing with chemicals and um, uh, alternative and nanoscale chemicals as well. What we are going to do today is discuss um, challenges with integrating Toxic Substances Control Act considerations into commercialization plans for renewable chemicals. We know this is of immense interest to bio member companies, and we thought we would spend about an hour and a half talking to you and asking or answering whatever questions you may have. 
What I would like to do now is introduce my two distinguished co-speakers. Uh, to my left here is Charlie Auer of Charles Auer and Associates, LLC. Charles Auer and Associates is affiliated with BNC. Many of you know Charlie by his distinguished reputation as being a 32-year career uh, luminary at EPA. He capped his very distinguished career with EPA in 2009 as director of EPA's Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics. In addition to knowing how EPA works internally, Charlie is a chemist and knows everything under the sun with regard to, to Tosca, really. We are just so thrilled to be affiliated with Charlie and all of the wonderful insights and expertise he brings to our problem-solving capacities. To my right is my colleague, Jim Adala. Uh, Jim also ended his distinguished government career as assistant administrator of the Toxics Office at EPA, where he oversaw both the industrial chemicals program and also the pesticide programs. Now, Jim and Charlie and their combined expertise and skill sets are just uniquely qualified to really talk about the issues that we're going to spend time talking about over the next hour or so, because it's a combination of knowing how the agency works, knowing who the people and the personalities and the perspectives of those who will be receiving information from biomember companies and others with respect to commercializing your bio-based chemicals, and also knowing the science and the law behind these programs. Now, before we go into um, uh, the substance of our program, I'd like to just run over a couple of administrative points. First, we plan to go about an hour on our formal presentations. There will be three. Uh, you are going to be muted during that component of the uh, webinar. After we give our formal presentations, we will then unmute the lines and invite you to ask whatever questions or request clarification on any point we may have raised. So because we're going to be covering a lot of turf and go through a lot of text, you might want to jot down your questions as they arise and then we will circle back and allow you plenty of time to ask your questions and then we will respond to them. Number two, both the PowerPoint presentation that we will be giving and the recorded webinar that is being recorded as we speak will be made available to BIO and be available on whatever member uh, site or resource that Dr. Singh and her colleagues wish to place it on. In other words, if you have to skip out now, or if there are others in your organization that you believe would benefit from uh, reviewing this webinar, you'll have an opportunity to download the webinar at some point over the next week or so, and it will be there as part of BIO's resources um, as an asset and as a benefit for BIO member companies. Number three, I wanted to let you all know and remind you of the forthcoming World Congress that BIO will be kicking off on Sunday, April the 29th in Orlando, Florida. This, as you know, is a spectacularly large event that brings in an international crowd of like-minded uh, businesses and entities. It will be running through May the 2nd. Uh, Bergeson and Campbell and Charles Auer and Associates will be putting on a workshop at 4 o'clock on Sunday, April the 29th, where we will be reviewing many of the themes that we are talking about today, but expanding on points that we believe might also be of interest to biomember companies and everyone else who is fortunate enough to attend the World Congress coming up next month. So uh, with that, I think we will move now into our program, unless there's anything either no. of you gentlemen would like to raise. Okay. All right, well, let's go into the substantive uh, component of the webinar. We really are going to be considering four key components uh, over the next hour or so. We are going to be going, uh, providing an overview of the global dynamic on renewable chemicals. We're then going to provide some background on the U.S. regulation of chemical substances under the Toxic Substances Control Act. We're then going to be moving into how best to integrate TSCA as a a very, very important legal component with respect to the approval and commercialization of bio-based chemicals, and how do you best integrate these considerations into your business plan? 
And then finally, give some thoughts on providing some strategy and tactics for assuring success. I'm going to kick uh, the discussion off by going over what we characterize here as the global dynamic on bio-based chemicals and give a little retrospective. As I'm sure many of you know, and for those of you who are intimately familiar with Tosca, forgive all of us for being more basic than perhaps you would like us to be, but we are going to go over some of the basic principles here uh, to provide a little historical background so we can compare and contrast where we've been and where we're going. And I think we all appreciate that the growth of the global chemical industry, certainly not just here in North America, but globally, uh, has largely been based on petroleum-based chemicals. Uh, since World War II, there's been an explosion of chemical uh, chemistries generally, all of which have been largely based on petroleum-based uh, feedstocks. When Congress implemented the Toxic Substances Control Act in 1976, uh, it implemented and ushered in a regulatory regime that is now pushing 33 years old or so. Uh, and when the agency was authorized to implement TSCA back in 1976, it did so in a way that drew a pretty significant distinction between chemicals that were in commerce at the time, considered existing chemicals, versus chemicals that were not then in existence or in commerce, which under the law are considered new. So these so-called grandfathered chemicals, or chemicals that were in commerce in 1978, then at about that time EPA began to implement the, uh, the law, it instituted a mechanism that inventoried existing chemicals, uh, those being chemicals that were notified to EPA back in 1978 and were deemed to be uh, existing chemical substances and put on the TOSCA Section 8 inventory. These so-called grandfathered petroleum-based chemicals were uh, and are listed on a national inventory called the TOSCA Chemical Inventory. Those chemicals were, were not independently reviewed for safety or health implications or environmental uh, impacts. They were more or less simply placed on a list and presumptively determined to be existing chemicals and were not, as I noted, independently reviewed by EPA. New chemicals under the law are, by definition, any chemical that is not listed on the TOSC inventory. Now, naturally, since 1978, the inventory has been supplemented with many new chemicals that have been newly added by virtue of the new chemicals program at EPA by virtue of the mechanisms that allow EPA to review and consider the safety aspects of a chemical, uh, which are subject to EPA review, and once they are cleared for EPA uh, review, are added to the inventory. So the, the take-home message here is that existing chemicals that were grandfathered under the TOSCA program when it was first uh, implemented in the late 70s were added to the TOSCA inventory, presumptively determined to be existing and not independently reviewed. New chemicals that were not on the inventory and needed to be added to the inventory as a predicate to their commercial distribution are treated differently and are certainly reviewed more strenuously and subject to EPA review as a predicate to their um, inclusion on the inventory. Now, over the past 30-plus years since TSCA has been um, in place, I think governments and industries alike have recognized the value of chemicals that are not based on petroleum-derived stocks. And governments, including the United States and virtually all other uh, governments, have done much to encourage more sustainable approaches to chemical development. Regulatory bodies have become very interested, for example, in alternative fuels and alternative bio-based chem chemistries for all the reasons of which we are aware. Uh, petroleum and oil is a, a limited resource that is not renewable. Uh, there are issues associated uh, and have been identified over the years with petroleum-based feedstocks. We know much more now than we did then about some of the biological and environmental implications of chemicals and various use patterns. Uh, here in the United States, uh, I think we all appreciate that certain classes of chemicals have been identified as posing uh, both biological and environmental challenges, and as a result, there are liabilities associated with their continued use, 
and just the the, the development of uh, sustainable mentalities and a desire to be more sustainable and greener, whatever that may mean, has been very much a part and very much a, uh, a growing tendency, certainly in the chemical and downstream user communities. Now, not surprisingly, industrial markets have been in many cases well ahead of governments in recognizing the benefits of bio-based chemistries. I think we've all appreciated uh, a significant uptake both here in the United States and globally in the de commercial development and new product development in uh, alternative uh, chemistries, uh, both with respect to bio-based chemistries and other chemistries that are moving us away from reliance upon bio-based feedstocks. Now, we'd like to talk a little bit about this global dynamic with respect to bio-based chemicals and how the, the then affects the now, because it's very important to appreciate how the uh, evolution of the TOSCA program impacts bio-based chemicals. In short, because bio-based chemicals are considered new, i.e. they are not listed on the TOSCA inventory and are treated differently from an administrative EPA perspective and must be reviewed by EPA as a condition to their commercialization, there are many more regulatory requirements that are imposed on chemicals now that were not um, imposed upon chemicals that were presumed to be existing and hence placed on the inventory and not subject to independent EPA review. So this is not only true here in the United States under TSCA and the distinction between new and existing chemicals, but this is a uh, trend in the law and perhaps is even more uh, significant in other jurisdictions. REACH, the uh, European Chemical Management Program that was ushered in in 2007, um, has largely eliminated the distinction between new and existing chemicals. And so the law under the uh, European program imposes very significant upfront testing requirements on unregistered chemicals or chemicals that were not otherwise pre-registered under the uh, REACH program. That is also true of a number of jurisdictions that are experience really a renaissance of chemical uh, development and chemical management review. Uh, the Chinese program um, that was implemented in uh, 2009 and became effective in October of 2010 is also um, much more rigorous with, its regard, with regard to its review of new chemicals. Uh, similar programs have been implemented in Taiwan, Japan, Canada, Turkey, New Zealand, and elsewhere. So I, th I think as a matter of global trending, Chemicals of all sorts, whether they are based on more traditional uh, petroleum chemistries or newer chemicals based on uh, biofeedstocks, are going to be seeing significant new challenges as a result of their need for pre-market review. Now, given the potential scale of bio-based chemical introductions over the coming years, we've certainly seen growth and an uptick in this area over the last several years, but we expect to see significant growth in this area over the years to come. These new chemical requirements really is, are, are beginning to represent a significant regulatory burden and are a potential impediment to commercial development. That's really a very core part of our message here, is to ensure that although the governments around the world, and certainly the United States government, are very supportive of newer uh, chemical um, technologies and wish to encourage the development of sustainable chemistries and bio-based uh, chemical development generally, we still have a regulatory infrastructure that is based on a 1970s distinction between new and existing chemicals. And because bio-based chemicals are presumptively considered new, it is important to appreciate the challenges that that then and now um, dichotomy pose. Now let's shift just a little bit into uh, focusing from a large overview perspective of forces having the greatest impact on bio-based product growth. I think 
you folks are a mature audience, you know your business, and you know that there are many factors that are affecting the growth or lack thereof of the bio-based chemical sector. But three primary uh, considerations warrant mention here. First, oil prices. I think we're all pretty much sick to death of hearing the expression pain at the pump, but oil prices continue to be a very significant reason why uh, entities are shifting away from petroleum-based feedstocks to different feedstocks that are uh, less costly. Uh, government policies and regulation generally, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but the governments around the world and certainly here in the United States are very supportive, uh, receptive, and wish to embrace alternative feedstocks that give um, less deference and reliance to limited uh, natural uh, resources like oil. And finally, advances in biosciences generally, uh, because we spend a lot of time here at Ferguson and Campbell and Charles Auer and Associates focusing on how our regulatory in uh, infrastructure um, supports or not the development of new technologies, particularly in the area of chemical development, whether it's uh, nanotechnology, biotechnology, synthetic biology, or bio-based feedstocks, we are seeing relentless uh, development and advancement in biosciences generally. And what we are seeing more and more is just a collision between these technological advances that really try to achieve more sustainable chemistries and a more sustainable economy, but not based on limited natural resources, um, but having some real challenges posed by statutory programs and um, the administrative apparatus that has grown up around them and not necessarily embracing some of these new technologies in a way that promote and uh, support their development um, with as much efficiencies as we would like. Here in the United States, just wanted to really quickly tick off a number of the uh, policies and uh, existing laws and other administrative programs that are intended to promote clean energy, green chemistry, and protect the environment. Uh, there are a whole host, uh, well beyond what we are able to consider here today, of legislative and regulatory initiatives that have been intentionally designed to spur the development of bio-based products. Uh, well over what, 18 years or so, or longer, in uh, August 12, 1999, Executive Order 13134 was uh, signed off, uh, in, which was intended to develop and promote bio-based products and bioenergy. This executive order set as a national objective the development of a national strategy to stimulate the creation and adoption of technologies needed to make U.S. bio-based products globally competitive. I mean, that's obviously very important, and although it's an executive order and not a statutory mandate, it gives expression to a national will to ensure bio-based chemicals and bio-based products are developed, supported, and nurtured. Uh, more recently in 2000, the Biomass Research and Development Act was passed. In 2002, the Farm Bill created the hugely popular and successful uh, Bio-Preferred Program. In 2005, the Energy Policy Act um, ushered in the renewable fuel standards, which have helped immeasurably in supporting and developing uh, renewable fuels. And in 2007, the Energy Independence and Security Act uh, was signed into law. This is just a smattering, um, and it's just intended to be illustrative of the United States' core commitment to foster and develop bio-based products. I'll just, um, we're going to pivot here to talk a little bit about the U.S. regulation of chemical substances, provide a little bit of background on the Toxic Substances Control Act scope. Um, as I mentioned and as we'll talk repeatedly over the next uh, 45 minutes or so, TSCA is the core U.S. federal statute that addresses chemical substances. Chemical substances are very broadly defined and intentionally so to include just about everything except if it's excluded. Uh, TSCA also provides EPA enormous authority to require testing of new and in some instances existing chemical substances. TSCA gives the EPA authority to regulate new chemical substances, again, prior to their commercial distribution and commerce, uh, import, processing, 
uh, provided those activities are intended for commercial purposes. You know, there are a number of exemptions from this, which are too um, numerous and kind of beyond the scope of our presentation here. But I think we appreciate that research and development activities are exempted from TSCA, and there are other exemptions. But on the whole, um, TSCA regulates new and existing chemical substances, authorizes EPA with enormous authority to require the testing of new and existing substances, uh, can regulate existing chemical substances um, for significant new uses, a strategy that we are seeing used much more often uh, today. In fact, over the last week, there have been two proposed significant new use rules published in the Federal Register as part of EPA's uh, Enhanced Chemical Management Plan. And TSCA obviously uh, has um, authorizes EPA enormous authority to uh, compel entities subject to it to maintain, collect, and or submit certain information and data to EPA. Now just uh, again, bearing on this important distinction between new and existing chemical, this is a very important distinction for purposes of the bio-based chemical community. While a bio-based chemical is derivative of a renewable feedstock, it can and often is chemically identical or similar to other chemicals that are considered existing because they are listed on the TSCA inventory. So the significance of that really cannot be overstated. While bio-based chemicals can be com compositionally similar to uh, chemicals that are listed on the inventory, they can be named and identified differently pursuant to various naming conventions that EPA has developed over the last 35 years. And because they are considered functionally or compositionally similar to an existing chemical, because they are named differently by virtue of various naming conventions, this triggers the need for the new chemical notification and new um, TSCA requirements for purposes of pre-manufacture notification to apply. So if it, this is similarly is the case for if a chemical is used as an intermediate in the manufacture of a downstream derivative, this too can trigger new chemical requirements for each of those chemical derivatives. So before I shift the discussion over to Charlie, I just want to again state that the core of our discussion here is to be mindful of the distinction between a new and existing chemical substance. If a chemical is considered new, it imposes significant new regulatory testing and notification obligations with EPA before any type of commercialization or distribution or import activity can occur. And because bio-based chemicals, while compositionally similar to an existing petroleum-based chemical uh, substance that is listed on the inventory, it may and often will be considered new for TSCA purposes that requires this uh, chemical notification and pre-market approval process under the TSCA program. And with that, I'm going to switch it over to Charlie, who will pick up and discuss why this matters. <clears throat> Thanks, Lynn. So why does it matter? I, I think the heart of the matter here is that uh, because of the way new uh, bio-based chemicals can be distinguished regulatorily from the materials that they compete with, that is the petroleum feedstock-based chemicals, this is likely to present a long-term challenge for the bio-based chemicals industry and its customers. Why is that? From my EPA uh, history, I know that EPA will look at this growth and development in bio-based chemistries as representing an important new class of commercial chemicals and they can be expected to scrutinize them closely. I think some at EPA will see this as an opportunity to get it right at the outset as these things are introduced into commerce. Because of this uh, close scrutiny that I, I think is to be expected from EPA, this can lead to delays in regulatory controls that bio-based chemicals may have to bear when the petroleum feedstocks are largely skating free. And then as Lynn has noted, because of the way chemicals are named, these requirements on feedstocks 
uh, can also percolate down to derivative chemicals that are based on these new bio-based materials because each of those derivative chemicals will also be differently identified and in many cases not have a counterpart on the Tosca inventory. So we have this situation. Green is good, but is it good enough? And I think that's the heart of the matter that we'll be exploring here. While, as Lynn has overviewed uh, USDA, EPA, executive orders, others have encouraged innovation in and use of bio-based chemicals. Ironically, because they are viewed as new chemicals for regulatory purposes, these chemicals can and do receive particular scrutiny by EPA due to the authorities it has under TSCA. Uh, for new chemicals. Given this situation, and I think this is a key part of our message, careful preparation uh, before you actually get into a notification, as well as an understanding of the EPA approaches, the policies, uh, the requirements that it may bring to bear, can be very helpful in avoiding or minimizing problems and delays in your commercial introductions. And these are the uh, key points that I'll be covering and then Jim will be offering some uh, somewhat broader perspectives on this. I'll start very briefly with uh, some of the challenges faced by genetically modified plants. I think from an EPA perspective, for TOSCA purposes, uh, the good news for you is that genetically modified plants are subject to control by USDA APHIS. At the same time, where you need not worry about uh, EPA oversight of the, of the new plant, chemicals extracted from those uh, plants, to the extent they're not the same as chemicals appearing on the TOSCA inventory, would be subject to EPA review. The uh, EPA requirements have a number of uh, pretty complex naming rules for bio-based chemicals. There is some flexibility within those naming rules. It's very important that you understand and apply that flexibility where it is available uh, in order to minimize your vulnerability to new chemical issues. There are certain ways these issues can be approached that uh, can help to resolve uh, those issues and perhaps get them to be appropriately classified as an existing chemical, uh, which would then mean they, they are not subject to uh, the new chemical requirements. Uh, I think an important aspect of the approach that EPA has taken to products derived from genetically modified plants is that they have not required that the fact that it's from a genetically modified plant be part of the chemical name. So if you have a chemical which is uh, being extracted from uh, soybeans, from uh, genetically modified soy plants, EPA will generally accept soya as opposed to the specifically identified genetically modified plant as being uh, the source of those chemicals. I think from your perspectives, that's very good news. At the same time, when a new bio-based chemical is introduced, and depending on the way that it's named, if it is a new chemical, then all of those downstream derivatives, there could be five products that you base on this, there could be 50 or 100 or 500 products if it's a real workhorse chemical that could be uh, derivatized starting as one of the uh, initiating materials, your new bio-based chemical. Uh, each of those downstream products in this cascade depending on the way they're named, could also be viewed as a new chemical. And because of this ripple effect that you can get, uh, I think that, that 
the bio-based chemicals industry just faces some uh, real challenges in how it will grow and develop its market given the likelihood that at least some significant fraction of the chemical products that are uh, that are derived from your materials can each have to go through this new chemical regime. EPA has authorities over genetically modified microorganisms. There was a rule that EPA implemented in the mid-90s uh, which requires a new chemical notification on intergeneric microorganisms. Uh, as shown in the slide, there are several types of notifications that are available, the microbial commercial activity notice. There are also uh, several uh, exemptions that are available from MCAN requirements for closed system type operations. There's also, also a uh, TOSC experimental release application uh, that's available to industry to uh, test a chemical, at least initially. Uh, so if you are, and I'm sure you're aware of this, if you're involved in development of genetically modified microorganisms, uh, those organisms themselves can be subject to TOSC oversight. At the same time, any chemicals extracted from those microorganisms, if they are not identifiable as a chemical already on the TOSC inventory, uh, those chemicals uh, would be subject to uh, new chemical requirements. Now, this is an area where I think when I was at EPA, the hope was that this market would really grow and develop and there would be uh, a steady increase in the number of, of uh, genetically modified microorganism notices coming to EPA. It really has been pretty slow uh, to uh, develop. Uh, there, there are really only a handful of uh, MCANs uh, that have come through. I think the Tier 1 and Tier 2 exemptions have seen more traffic, but, it, but still overall it, I think it's a pretty limited um, development which has occurred. I'll now shift into bio-based chemicals per se. Uh, as we've uh, outlined before, there are certain basic requirements that apply to uh, new chemicals under TOSCA. They must be notified 90 days in advance. There's a requirement that the notice include certain information. Uh, you are required to submit health and safety data to the extent there are, that information is available. Other information like volume and uses and exposures are more explicit requirements that have to be satisfied. EPA then takes that information that you've submitted and reviews it to determine the need for and nature of any regulatory measures. And as we've been messaging, if you think carefully about what you're doing, prepare in advance, understand EPA's approaches, uh, you can begin and end that process, hopefully with a minimizing of uh, potential for disruptions. Here are the key elements that EPA considers in uh, doing its evaluation. Uh, as we've indicated, a key question is what is the chemical? How is it named and identified? Uh, is it on the inventory for bio-based chemical feedstocks in particular where uh, the name of the plant can be uh, an important part of the name, soya, for example? Uh, that fact can lead to a lot of those materials uh, being seen by EPA as uh, new chemicals, which then triggers that notification requirement. TOSC is a risk-based statute, so EPA looks carefully at the information on hazards and exposures and from that attempts to assess the risks. EPA has also developed a number of policy drivers uh, that uh, it applies to new chemicals. An important question to be aware of is does your new chemical trigger any of those policy drivers? Does the new chemical provide benefits such as uh, technological benefits or cost or performance benefits? If so, that's valuable information that you need to make sure you pull together and make available to EPA. 
Can it be argued that your new chemical can contribute to reducing risks or preventing pollution? If so, that's another area to give focus and attention to. Can you make green chemistry arguments about your chemical? This is also an area that EPA will be very attuned to. The bottom line for EPA in its review of new chemicals is the following. Based on the information and understanding which is available to EPA, is there a need for regulatory controls or testing to be imposed on your new chemical or not? So how does EPA approach its review of pre-manufacture notifications or PMNs? Uh, the first point is one that we've talked about a lot, uh, the, the naming approach. EPA has certain rules that it has developed regarding the naming of chemicals, which are in some ways distinct from the naming rules that are otherwise applied by chemical abstract services. So you really have to have an understanding of the approaches that EPA brings regarding the naming and identification of chemicals to ensure that you're doing it in a way that will be found acceptable by EPA. EPA always starts its review with the notice that you submit. Therefore, it's very important to think carefully about the information that is included in that notice. Since test data are only infrequently provided to EPA as part of the notice, over half of all new chemicals, for example, include no submitted health or safety information. EPA relies on a number of predictive tools and models known as structure activity relationships to assess the potential health and environmental hazards and the environmental fate that uh, may be presented by your new chemical. EPA also uses exposure modeling and assumptions which start with the information that you have provided in your notice, that factual body of information about your exposures, your processes, your uses, your volumes, and then extends it through use of uh, models or the application of assumptions if certain key information is not available. EPA also assesses exposures very broadly depending on the nature of the uses to which your chemical uh, is involved. This can involve occupational, commercial, consumer, environmental releases, and general population exposures that could be associated with your chemical. And then finally, if the exposure details are not available, EPA will use what it terms reasonable worst case, worst case assumptions to allow it to assess the exposure potential for your chemical. For this reason, it's very important to think carefully about the factual information that you provide in your notice so that you can minimize the opportunity where EPA may use these reasonable worst case assumptions and get it wrong regarding the uh, processes and practices that you follow in manufacturing and using your chemical and attribute a greater exposure potential to that chemical than is actually the case. Another important aspect of EPA's assessment process to appreciate is that EPA uses a staged assessment process. There are two key parts in that process. Uh, the first is what EPA calls initial review. This is the process that EPA uses through about day 20. At this point in EPA's process, they've made decisions to drop about 80% of all new chemicals that are submitted to EPA. The 20% that are not dropped then continued into what EPA calls standard review. This is the review that proceeds up until day 90. It can also be the review that leads to those requests for uh, suspensions by EPA. Another important aspect of this overall process to bear in mind is that only about 
of all new chemicals are ever regulated by EPA. About 90% or so are eventually dropped uh, and essentially cleared for introduction into commerce by uh, the notifier. Uh, I think an issue that uh, you may encounter, however, is that while, as a general matter, only a relatively small fraction of new chemicals are regulated, if EPA snags one of your new chemicals, I think it's likely that others like it will be, will be similarly snagged by EPA and be regulated. So this is a case where you need to be very alert to the situation, take steps to minimize your vulnerabilities. If you do get snagged, think about ways that you might approach it so as to overcome those vulnerabilities for this case as well as for future cases. EPA has also developed some 56 categories of concern. These are chemical categories which, based on its prior experience, EPA has typically uh, assessed as presenting an issue or, in most cases, regulated in a certain manner. If your chemical falls into one of these categories, you need to recognize that fact and, uh, if you can, avoid that kind of uh, an assignment. Uh, and uh, this may require you to change the way you think about the new chemical that you're introducing, but to the extent you can recognize the issue, there may be ways that you can avoid that vulnerability. Information on these categories of concern can be found in EPA's uh, website. EPA will assess the risks presented by your chemical, uh, and for this, they will use information on analogous chemicals or structure activity predictions. They'll rely on the release and exposure information in the PMN and will supplement this as appropriate with models or assumptions. All of this is aiming to produce a quantitative risk assessment uh, where possible, and if that risk assessment shows the potential for unacceptable risk, EPA will move to test or uh, require controls. The policy drivers that EPA has developed uh, are really two. One is a policy for persistent bioaccumulative and toxic chemicals, where if your chemical falls into that PBT category, uh, you can expect that it will be subjected to tighter controls if environmental releases or exposures are expected. The criteria are available on EPA's website, but in general, uh, things such as uh, over two months persistence in water, a thousand-fold bioaccumulation, et cetera, will uh, have the potential for triggering a PBT uh, designation. EPA has also established policy criteria uh, for requiring what it calls exposure-based testing. This is using a particular authority under TSCA. If you have a high-volume new chemical, production above 100,000 kilograms per year, potential for more than 1,000 workers to be exposed, if it's also used in consumer products, those are the kind of factors that in combination can cause your chemical to be subjected to exposure-based testing. When EPA determines uh, that or thinks that it may need to take a regulatory measure, there are certain legal determinations that it must make in order to support that need for a regulation. Uh, one of these is uh, the so-called risk-based finding that a chemical may present an unreasonable risk. In making that determination, EPA will also consider the benefits of the chemical. The complementary finding to that is that of substantial production and exposure. This goes back to the exposure-based testing policy. And then the third is the likelihood that your new chemical could have what are called significant new uses. Uh, this is a situation where uh, if EPA believes that your chemical could be used in ways other than those you have described, it can take regulatory measure 
to essentially require subsequent new chemical notifications for those significant new uses. Regarding 5E consent orders, there are two basic types. Uh, the first is a unilateral ban, or what EPA terms a ban pending testing. This will generally be used for chemicals where the testing is relatively expensive. EPA will ask you to suspend the notice in order to allow for the testing to occur. The other approach is a negotiated order where the company and EPA negotiate a set of control conditions and testing requirements. In entering into this negotiation, EPA can pursue very narrow and specific controls or broad controls. Some of what EPA may want to do could cause, uh, could require you to change some of your processes and practices in order to accommodate uh, the, the controls that EPA believes are necessary. One particular example that can present real issues for companies is where EPA is looking for a control which would allow no releases to water from the production or processing of your new chemical. At the end of the day, where you as the notifier and EPA uh, reach agreement on the order, uh, it will be signed, and that the new chemical will be allowed to enter into commerce subject to the terms of the, the order. In order to allow for this negotiation process, EPA will ask you to suspend the notice period. These suspensions last months at a minimum, not infrequently. They can go on for a year or more before you and EPA uh, can get to um, a final agreement. The other type of control measure is a significant new use rule. There are several types of SNRs that EPA applies. Uh, one of these is the so-called 5E SNR, which has the effect of extending the 5E requirements uh, downstream to any processors of your chemical or to any other company that uh, may wish to commercialize uh, your chemical. Uh, under this approach, you negotiate the 5E order. EPA indicates that it, it intends to implement a SNR. You are enabled to go into commerce. In the meantime, EPA will propose and promulgate that significant new use rule. The other type is a so-called non-5E SNR. Here, EPA has uh, concluded that the chemical, when used as described in the, pre, in the PMN, won't present significant risk. So EPA will allow the chemical to go into commerce without a 5E order. However, EPA will tell you that they are taking that type of determination and that they intend to implement a non-5E SNR, which would go to uses or exposures which are beyond the practices that are included in your new chemical notice. EPA will then take that action to implement the SNR, and that would require that all companies and you, uh, as the notifier and manufacturer, to comply with the terms of the SNR. While between these two, a non-5E SNR is generally the easiest regulation to deal with, oftentimes it presents relatively little delay in your commercial introduction, at the same time, uh, there can be understandings that you will then you will need to apply to your downstream customers so that they don't go beyond uh, the informal understanding you had with EPA about uses and exposures. And until EPA actually implements that SNR, you will feel a certain uncertainty. So if you are confronted by regulatory action or a request for suspension, here's a little bit of advice for you to consider once you find yourself in that situation. The first is to get a clear understanding of EPA's concerns and its planned actions. Second, 
given the potential for delays and disruptions, carefully consider your options by asking questions such as those presented on the slide. And then finally, an important step, and I encourage that, that all of you do this when you find yourself in this situation, is to request that EPA provide copies of its assessments to you. Uh, it's been my experience that EPA will provide this information. Uh, they don't like to have to provide it for a variety of reasons, but nonetheless, if you press them to receive copies of the assessments, you can get that information. You need that in order to understand the specifics of the case which is being made against you and its factual basis. For example, you may find upon review of the exposure assessment that EPA's reasonable worst case assumptions aren't relevant to your situation. If you have that assessment, you can then raise these points with EPA and get them to change their exposure assessment to more accurately uh, reflect your approach. Once you've decided to proceed with the regulatory process, in other words, EPA has asked you to uh, suspend a notice while it uh, takes some action, uh, the suggestion is that you should keep the suspension short unless there's a good argument for a longer period. Next, be careful to document and create a record of any calls or other transactions with EPA. For example, be sure you fully understand what are EPA's concerns and the basis that they use to identify those concerns. Exactly what types of restrictions and testing is EPA after? Ask EPA to explain why the suspension is needed and what EPA will do during the suspension period and also what you as the notifier are expected to do during the suspension period and by when. And then finally, <clears throat> be diligent and timely in and document your responses and actions. Be clear that you expect EPA to be similarly diligent and timely in its treatment of your case. Finally, it's useful to bear in mind as you go through this process that your PMN is one of probably hundreds that are at play before EPA at any point in time. And EPA staff are busy keeping up with all these uh, parts that are moving. And while a certain forbearance can be helpful, it's also important to recognize that you do have the opportunity and should consider the value of elevating an issue within EPA if you believe that EPA is not adequately considering your perspectives or if the process is unduly delayed. The reality at EPA is that new chemical decisions are highly delegated and that most follow an approach which has been applied by EPA to other similar new chemicals. There is also only a limited amount of flexibility which is available to your principal contact, that being the EPA notice manager. Because of this, there may be issues uh, or aspects relevant to your case that are, are not being adequately appreciated, and you may need to push that issue up to an EPA management official in order to get an appropriate consideration of your arguments. You should, of course, consider your situation carefully before elevating the issue, but at the same time, recognizing the idiosyncrasies in EPA's new chemicals process, as opposed to other more traditional regulatory proceedings, if you believe your arguments are strong, you should not hesitate to elevate the issue. And if you decide to elevate the issue, if you have also followed the other suggestions that I made about careful documentation as to what occurred and when. 
including any understandings that you reached with EPA along the way, that record can be very valuable in carrying your arguments effectively to EPA. Now I'll switch to Jim, who will offer some bigger picture strategies for ensuring success. I mean, it's a little bit like being um, the in-house anthropologist uh, trying to explain and predict EPA behavior. Uh, Charlie just gave a great detailed uh, description of some of the literal step-by-step -step things that you will have to go through or that you should go through, and uh, shall we say the advice that we would have for clients. Uh, I'm going to take a little more of an abstract view, try and do it quickly be so we can get to questions and answers uh, before we wrap up for the afternoon. Um, basically, uh, I think I've tried to have my section here be talking about strategies for success in approaching EPA, and especially the question of elevating issues that you may need to, to if you will, take upstairs. Um, most of the time, uh, you may think that, of course, you want to go talk to, straight to the administrator because this policy may be impeding this great and good thing that you're trying to get to market. Um, you almost never want to start too high. You want to work your way up the system. And that's something that we routinely find ourselves advising clients about how to, if you will, know, know when to hold them, know when to fold them. Uh, that being said, we've tried to develop a few uh, tips, if you will, for, uh, for assuring success. Uh, some of them may seem pretty obvious, but you'd be surprised how handy it is to have this kind of checklist along the way. Um, fundamentally, plan ahead, have the right people, have the right issues, have the information supporting your argument. Typically, you might think this is, quote, clear. Um, sometimes the EPA might be seen as clear as mud. Um, other times, you might certainly want to keep in mind that, as, as I think Charlie has stressed in particular, there's a certain culture, standard operating procedures, and, and if you will, the, the ways and methods of the, of the EPA process, and, and you have to be aware of that even if you want to disagree with that. Uh, and again, uh, what I like to advise some folks, uh, it's reasonable to ask reasonable questions. It's okay to be um, firm in your beliefs and to have a, a strong backing up of that by the facts uh, and articulate what you believe the benefits to be because all those would be relevant considerations as EPA tries to move the issue forward. Um, overall, again, it's almost too simplistic to say that you have to carefully manage uh, new products that you may seek to develop in this market. Uh, we've said it a couple different times, but again, I uh, certainly want to stress, and, and some of you may have already found out the hard way that, you know, you know green is good, but may, may not be good enough. Um, you know, it, uh, again, very s simply stated, EPA takes its, its duties under looking at new chemical introductions quite seriously, uh, and especially if some of you, in a, uh, you're in a business, you're in a business to make a lot of product, uh, get a lot of sales. Well, by definition, if you look at wide, higher volume products, it's going to raise uh, more questions just initially off the top when EPA is looking at your, at your uh, PMN or other kinds of proposals. Um, EPA is very open to the benefits of bio-based products and greener, sustainable technologies. Uh, green chemistry is an overused term, uh, not just for this administration, even beforehand. Um, <clears throat> but again, that, that fact alone is just unlikely to be sufficient. In particular, and this is certainly something I, I think everyone by now has understood from Charlie's presentation and some of the things that Lynn has said, there's a number of default methods and sorting, to, sorting algorithms, uh, def, uh, again, default uh, assumptions, uh, methods of operation, SOPs, if you will, and that sometimes that may work to your detriment, especially, again, as I think Charlie said it expressly, if, if one of your products is snagged, uh, it probably means that you're going to have similar problems uh, with similar products down the road. Uh, what you need to do is have as part of your business development plan, and this is really one of the key takeaways of the afternoon presentation, uh, you need to have as part of your business development plan the idea that you have to deal with some of these issues that may arise at EPA. Um, you don't want to have an, an unseen or unpredicted delay. Uh, uh, you may have all your financing in place, you've got everything ready to go, you're ready to get uh, in whatever the next level of your development of a product, but then there's this EPA thing coming in, quote, at the last minute. You, you want to avoid that last minute kind of problem because that last minute may then take many months and that upsets business development plans. Again, very simply stated, prepare for that EPA scrutiny and the possible things that could go wrong. The old saying of, of you know, plan for the best, prepare for the worst. You may end up having some kind of problems with 
uh, the, what again you think may be clear, but it turns out that EPA may say the implications are a little bit different. This is especially about the naming conventions and the way EPA uh, conducts its SOPs for, for the new chemical review process. Uh, again, to the extent anyone can do this, you, you want to anticipate and deal with those issues as soon as possible. And in particular, and this is a bit of, I'm not, it, it's, it's, don't want to make light of it, but there is an anthropological element. But understand where EPA is coming from. What is the nature of their operation? What is the nature of the kind of concerns they have? Uh, Charlie's articulated some of, the, some of the things we call here policy drivers. Uh, those are going to be sensitive concerns by those people across the board that you deal with at EPA. Um, again, it's fair to be firm. Uh, you need to be responsive and polite, professional, all those kind of good admonitions. At the same time, you do need to stand your ground. The, with all due respect, we think you may have misunderstood something here. Charlie said one reason to get the reviews of the assessment is it turns out that, again, with all due respect, you have some of the science wrong. At least that's, we need to have a, a better scientific explanation of some of the things that you say you may be concerned about. And at the end of the day, notwithstanding all of these cautions, remember, most new chemicals do get approved. Uh, there is a bias towards green chemistry. Uh, it's helpful, but again, at the same time, you're fighting against 30 plus years of, of standard operating procedures uh, that have not seen quite, uh, quite so much emphasis on green chemistry, the advent of some of the new technologies. Outlook overall, uh, there's a you know, EPA is not alone. The other agencies are also favorable to this kind of technology, but not every uh, bio-based chemical can have the same kind of lobby as the ethanol lobby. Uh, there are renewable fuels, and that's a bio-based strategy in many quarters, but most of these other technologies don't have that same kind of political clout here in Washington. Uh, over time, EPA will get better at all this. They will develop new SOPs. They will develop a new familiarity with some of the kinds of things that will be uh, characteristic of these kinds of products. But right now, whoever's early in the process will have the unfortunate situation of being one of the um, pioneers, if you will. And sometimes it's not good to be the pioneer. But if you want to get that kind of technology to market or that kind of product to market, you're going to have to just deal with some of the things that we've talked about here. At the same time, um, there is some safety in numbers. Um, there is some ability to spread out some of the concerns among uh, your brethren. Bio is a great example of your, you have a similar interest, that's why you're members of that organization. Uh, those similar members across a trade organization may have common interests, that's what trade associations especially are about. Uh, and you can bring concerns to the agency. You can bring concerns and discussions among yourselves to attempt to anticipate and resolve some of the kinds of problems that we've talked about. Uh, the trade groups and just even ad hoc coalitions, if you will, can help articulate some of those issues, uh, can articulate some response to things that may have come up at EPA or that you think might come up at EPA and try and, and have some impact on those policies or decisions along the way. Uh, how to approach not just your PMN, this is almost advice about any issue with EPA to help ensure success. Obviously, to the extent you can anticipate those issues, it's helpful to know what you're dealing with. Uh, explain the benefits of your product. As mentioned, TSCA is a risk-benefit balancing statute. Uh, you can really go in and try and make the case for your, your product. Some of that might be quantitative, some of it may be qualitative, but the more specific you can be, the better. Uh, again, understand, if you will, where EPA is coming from. There are certain things they've clearly identified. We've, it's listed on their websites, listed any time they have a public discussion of some of the concerns about PBTs, for example. Those are going to be, you know, clear hot-button issues if they come in. It doesn't mean you shouldn't submit something with that kind of characteristic. It just means know that ahead of time and be able to plan on it and have a response for it. Uh, EPA has, again, not just the rhetoric, but some specific tools, calling it Sustainable Futures Tools, for example, to identify, again, green chemistry, new technologies, new safer technologies. Uh, if, again, you're concerned that there may be an unreasonable assumption about potential releases or exposures, be ready to anticipate that question and respond to it. And, again, at the end of the day, you may have to do more testing. If that's the case and you can be pretty clear beforehand, you may want to get a jump start on that and have that information with you before you go into EPA. Uh, how do you interact with EPA? Again, in simple terms, politely but firmly. I have a few things on the slide here. Uh, everything from, again, a pre-meeting can help. 
Uh, sometimes there's a bit of a, a square peg round hole problem. This, we know this sort of meets these kind of criterion. We, we think these are the characteristics that we can clearly see are subject to some other past policies and practices that EPA is familiar with, but this is a little different. Uh, and of course, we'd like to get your opinion, EPA, about, well, it's a little different, but can we kind of assume a certain other thing and related to that? Or no, it's, it's very different, and we're going to need probably to talk to you more about how different it is and what it may mean. Uh, when you ask for something, obviously, uh, it's okay to ask. Um, try and get the perspective. Um, Charlie mentioned something, with all due respect, that may be the most important thing for you and your company. At the same time, EPA is dealing with thousands of these at any given time uh, over a given year, which means hundreds or certainly tens of, of these kinds of submissions at any given time in, in any individual desk. Um, sometimes, again, novel issues just have to be raised. Uh, good news, bad news. You've got some very innovative product, um, but recognize that may present some issues that become a time sink. Uh, again, we like to advise clients. Um, it's okay. It's reasonable to ask reasonable questions. It's okay to disagree if you need to. Uh, you need to stand your ground uh, politely, but again, do so, you know, um, firmly because it, it may be a, a simple disagreement over the science or some interpretation of a policy. And that's okay to raise those kinds of issues or even threaten to elevate those issues. Uh, again, you may need to elevate the issue above the level of the initial reviewer or even reviewers, the branch that you're dealing with, uh, to, to raise it to a higher level to get some kind of, of resolution um, by EPA. Overall, and this really isn't just a conclusion about some of the things I've said in this last section, but rather for the entire discussion so far, EPA encourages green products, but the regulatory uh, requirements can sometimes slow down adoption or uh, the ability to introduce those products to market. Green is good, it may not be good enough. EPA isn't very much a, a science-driven agency. We all respect that. Uh, at the same time, uh, the review requirements procedures may, may ironically lead to more novel and uh, new, if you will, levels of regulatory scrutiny because the products are different. They aren't the same as petroleum-based feedstocks, and that novelty may, again, in effect, cause some, some issues or problems, uh, and at least in terms of some potential for delay, which for adoption of new products and new technologies can be um, fairly uh, negatively uh, impactful. Uh, careful attention along the way, uh, before, during, after <laughs> a commercial introduction, and can avoid and anticipate some of those regulatory problems. So otherwise, those could hinder your operations. They could hinder the delay and uh, they can hinder things by causing a delay in product introductions. They could uh, come up with, quote, new regulatory controls that you didn't anticipate. That could be everything from a simple cost to especially um, um, a very impactful delay. And other things. Related challenges is a fancy way of, thing, of things we haven't thought of before. Again, you're, you're going to face a problem if there's a, a novel element. Um, sometimes, again, innovations, I wouldn't say it's penalized, but it sometimes has an, a negative issue and may raise new issues, and new issues means you may have to have some new procedures that will have to apply to your situation. I think that was it on my section, which means we're now ready for questions. I'll turn it to Lynn, and we can open it up, I think. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Charlie. And we do now encourage you to ask questions. We are going to unmute the lines. All guests have been unmuted. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Funny how that operates. <laughs> the voice of George. So for, for those of you on the call that um, this is very basic and you know all this, our apologies. But for those of you that might be newer to the TOSCA program, uh, we're happy to revisit any of the concepts that we noted um, or explore areas that we neglected to discuss um, and are ready for your questions. And uh, Dr. Singh, if you have any uh, comments or questions you'd like to supplement now while people are teeing up questions, uh, feel free to jump in. Sure, Lynn. Why don't I kick one off here real quickly? So if I were to have... Uh a bio-based chemical, specifically a, a renewable chemical, bioadipic acid, and um, I also have, of course, the petroleum uh, adipic acid. Would that be considered uh, a new, under the category of new, because it's coming from a different source and using a different process? 
or, or how would that be regarded? Yeah, I think the, uh, the answer is that it will depend on the specifics. If you look at the inventory, EPA has a series of naming conventions for petroleum products, which can identify the, the type of uh, feedstock that it comes from, or have a boiling point, or a vapor pressure, or uh, a rich in certain constituents. If your bio-based gas can be named in a way which is consistent with the way that a petroleum material is named, you can skate free. I think the issue that you have a lot of times is with the feedstocks, which almost invariably will have a name like soya as part of it, if it's a, if it's a plant-based uh, material, whereas the corresponding uh, petroleum feedstock will have some petroleum-related name. As you fractionate that and get out specific cuts from the product, those may or may not begin to come together in the names. You can also have a situation where chemicals that you can't get to through uh, petroleum-based chemistries very readily are uh, well available within a bio-based material. And so you can have a chemical which, because of its sourcing, will be named, it could be the placement of the double bond in the chain or whatever the case might be, named in a way where there's no petroleum-based counterpart. That will then be uh, a new chemical, whereas the petroleum product, which also has a double bond, but it's typically at another location, skates free. So I think one of the uh, take-home messages here, uh, Dr. Singh, and your, your question really focuses on it properly, is that few generalities can be made because we're dealing with new chemistries, we're dealing with the application of existing TSCA infrastructure and naming conventions on these new chemistries, and part of our message is to ensure that the constellation of questions as to the naming, whether it's considered new or existing, um, are identified and kind of thought through carefully at the front of the process as opposed to the end. And I know that that's a particularly challenging concept because in all cases you may not know what you might be derivatizing and you may not know what the chemical identity is. But our message is to the extent that these issues invariably need to be addressed, it's best to have them framed at the front end of the process so you can at least explore strategies that really ought to be considered at the front end of a process because you can't be addressing these issues inconsistently from a TSCA compliance and regulatory perspective. Uh, and that's an, another whole area of discussion that we could get into, but, but we won't in the interest of time. But as these issues are often um, somewhat novel for EPA, and because naming conventions are a lot of science, a little bit of art and some law, the, the, the end result is not always predictable. So best to try to sort these issues out at the front end, do so with your chemists, do so with your TSCA aficionados on staff, and when in doubt, uh, try to tee up a list of questions that you can raise with EPA at a pre-meet along the lines that Charlie indicated so you can at least get a sense of what types of challenges you may be looking at and what type of market delays you may be encountering. Jim, did you have any thoughts? No, other than the part about a pre-meeting, I said it on, on my slides, I think we all have or been believers in it. Uh, I would just say one caution about it is you don't want to go and give away the story. Well, we think this could be a big problem, but we're not sure because you're sort of signaling that, in fact, okay, they heard the words big problem and then... <laughs> and that's all they heard. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then kind of turned off after that. So even a pre-meeting, which, again, we almost always encourage, Lynn just articulated a rationale, uh, again, uh, you just have to be even be careful going in on a pre-meeting. Very good. Thank you. Other questions? You, you can put a hanky over the phone to disguise your voice if you'd like. Yeah, this is Kendall Pye. I have a question about how bio-based polymers are being uh, regarded in this area. 
it, it's a question of the definition of structure. I mean, a polymer is not usually a single molecular weight. And so if you have a polymer as a product, you're going to have a range of molecular weights. How are these issues addressed in, with EPA? You know, I, I think that uh, you may have sometimes, uh, some cases where the bio-based uh, case mirrors the one that EPA has typically encountered. In other cases, it can be, it can be different. The typical way that EPA names polymers is as polymer of A, B, C, and D, and that's the name. There's no information about uh, reaction sequence or nature of the reactions, the molecular weight, et cetera. That information is conveyed to EPA in the new chemical notice, but it's not part of the name. Now, if you are deriving bio-based monomers, going into polymers, those would fit into that same polymer of ABCD situation. If it's a new monomer, you can expect that every derivative polymer from that new monomer would be subject to new chemical notifications. Now, if you're using your uh, renewable chemistry to essentially produce uh, a plant-based polymeric material, that material would have to be named as appropriate, uh, and whether it is identifiable as a, uh, a natural chemical that, and, you know, a naturally available material which is only extracted by gravimetric or solubility or whatever methods. In other words, there's no chemical reaction involved. You can escape new chemical review. But if in doing that reaction you've had to derivatize it or, or do whatever to get it out or to increase its chemical functionality, there's a very great likelihood that any such bio-based polymers would be classified as new chemicals. Yeah, thank you. I, it, it, under REACH, I believe there is an exemption for polymers, isn't there? Is there something equivalent to that under the EPA? Tosca? Yeah, you know, uh, the European scheme has always stopped their review at the level of the monomers and only in certain circumstances considered the polymers. Tosca has always evaluated polymers as part of its uh, review. There are exemptions that are available for polymers. Uh, these polymers have to meet certain criteria concerning molecular weight and whatnot. If your bio-based polymer satisfies those criteria, you could go in under the terms of that exemption. But I seem to recall there's something in the details of that exemption that may not uh, be as open to bio-based polymers as opposed to more traditional ABCD polymers. Thank you. Other questions? Well, before we, we wrap up, as we are nearing the end of our time, I just wanted to raise two points supplementing many of the comments that Jim raised, because I think there are, there's an external and an internal component here uh, with regard to opportunities for proceeding. As Jim indicated, and Charlie, you know, I think EPA is very predisposed to promoting chemistries that are based on renewable feedstocks and helping us move away from our dependency upon petroleum-based chemicals. That said, there's a component here for the industry as a whole to embrace, and that is to get out there and educate EPA, educate EPA as to the value proposition, why these chemicals are really, really valuable, their renewability, their sustainability. But a lot of the information that we've been sharing here today that we have picked up over the years in our work with nanochemicals uh, and other um, more emerging technologies is it's good to get out there and educate EPA as much as you can because it, this information is not necessarily intuitively self-evident. And on the internal side of the equation, we really, really emphasize to the greatest extent possible that these issues, as arcane as and seemingly nerdy as they may be, be brought into the business planning process way early uh, and not be thought of as a somewhat 
um, incidental after the fact concern, as Charlie indicated and Jim, after you've got your financing lined up and your business plan set, it's a little bit too late in the game to be considering some of these issues. So we, we know from our experience that businesses, evolving uh, platforms often tend to silo issues to the extent that the Tosca side of the equation can be brought in and have a, have a seat at the table along with the business planning process for rolling out a new chemical or a new technology, I think your business interests are going to be served uh, well. Uh, one final thought, and that is to again to remind folks that th with the World uh, Bio World Congress coming up on April the 29th, at 4 o'clock on April the 29th, we will be expanding upon some of these concepts and giving a workshop for any of uh, those on the call right now that will be uh, in attendance. We urge you to, to join us, and we can consider these topics and more. And also, this presentation and the PowerPoint that accompanies it will be made available to Dr. Singh, for bio member uh, company interest, and you can review it and uh, use it and uh, share this presentation with your colleagues uh, down the road. So, Dr. Singh, with that, I think we will, on behalf of Bergeson and Campbell and Charlie, Charles Auer and Associates, uh, wrap this oh, okay. up and I'll urge you to conclude um, with whatever remarks you may wish to offer. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Lynn. Uh, certainly would like to give a a huge thank you from uh, not only BIO, but our, our BIO members for the opportunity to have had this hour and a half uh, great presentation, enlightenment from your end. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Uh, thank you, Charles and, and Jim, uh, for a great uh, opportunity and uh, uh, the, the uh, slides and presentations we will work with. Uh, from our end to get it on our on our website okay. at BIO, and uh, we look forward uh, to your presentation workshop in uh, uh, the World Congress, Orlando, Florida. Uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, and goodbye, everyone. <laughs>